Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Grimes. I'm your host, Tyler Groff Von Rebeck. And today we'll be reading about the case of Dean Coral, the Candyman of Houston. As you can see, I'm back using a phone because writing is not for me. Arthritis is not good. Childhood. Oh, by the way, this is going to be a very dark episode from what I hear. So, Childhood. Dean Arnold Coral was born on December 24th. Hey, Christmas Eve. How about that? But for those of you who celebrate Christmas, I mean, you know, I obviously do not. 1939, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the first child of Mary Emma Robinson and Arnold Edwin Coral. Coral's father was strict with his children, whereas his mother was relatively protective of both her sons. The marriage was marred by frequent fighting, and the couple ended up getting a divorce in 1946, four years after the birth of their younger son, Stanley Wayne Coral. Mary subsequently sold off the family home and moved to a trailer park in Memphis, Tennessee, where Arnold had been drafted into the Air Force after the divorce to allow her sons to remain in contact with their father. That's nice. That's nice of her. Dean was a shy, serious child who rarely socialized. At the age of seven, he had suffered from a case of rheumatic fever, which was undiagnosed until the doctors discovered he had a heart murmur in 1950. As a result, Coral was ordered not to partake in extracurricular activities in school, which further distanced him from the other children. Coral's parents attempted reconciliation and remarried in 1950, moving to Pasadena, Texas, a suburb of Houston. However, their reconciliation was short-lived, and in 1953, they got re-divorced, with the mother again getting custody of both sons. However, the divorce was granted on amicable grounds, and the kids were allowed to have main regular contact with their father. That's good. In a lot of divorces, they tend to end pretty bad, so that's, that's good. Following the second divorce, Coral's mother married a traveling salesman named Jake West, and the family moved to Vidor, Texas. Coral's mother and stepfather started a family candy company, initially out of the garage of their home. Hey, that's... That's interesting. Have you ever, um, if you ever look up like how many businesses, how many famous businesses started out of the garage of your of the home, you'd be surprised. Like I think Apple or Microsoft or Dell or some big technological company. Oh, and Z Best, that fraudulent uh, cleaning company with uh, Barry Minkow. Coral and his younger brother were responsible for running the candy making machines and packing the products, which the stepfather sold on his sales route. From 1954 to 1958, Coral attended the Vidor High School, where he was regarded as a well-behaved student who kept satisfactory grades. As had been the case in childhood, Coral was also considered a loner and an outsider, although he is known to occasionally have dated girls in the teen years. Coral graduated from Vidor in the summer of 1958, and thereafter the family moved to the northern outskirts of Houston so the family candy business could be closer to the city where the majority of it was sold. Coral's family opened a new shop called Pecan Prince. What? In reference to the brand name of the family product. Pecan Prince. That doesn't sound like a candy company. That sounds more like a, a brand name for a subsidiary of planters. You know, with the legume, with the, the top hat, and the monocle, and the, it looks like the Monopoly Man of Peanuts. In 1960, at the request of his mother, Coral moved to Indiana, where he would live with his widowed grandmother. During this time, Coral formed a close relationship with a woman, although he rejected a subsequent marriage proposal she made to him in 1962. Coral lived in Indiana for two years, but returned to Houston in 62 to help with the family's candy business, which was beginning to fail. He later moved into an apartment above, of his own above the shop. Coral's mother divorced West in 1963 and opened a new candy business called the Coral Candy Company, or CCC, because that's very long. Her eldest son was appointed the vice president of the company, with her with the younger brother Stanley being the secretary treasurer. That's cool, like a family business. No, I guess it is a family business. Has her name. Why well, I say that? But I mean, like Gucci was a family business, and today nobody from Gucci works at Gucci. That's a good film, by the way. House of Gucci. Shout out. Definitely. If you haven't seen it yet, watch it. Just don't watch Jared Leto, because he sucks. In that film. Possibly. 
The same year, one of the teenage male employees of the CCC complained to the mother that her son had made sexual advances toward him, and in response, she fired Coral. Okay, well, bad idea. Coral was drafted into the United States Army on August. What's a bad idea that he would make unwanted advances towards another of the workers and stuff? Coral was drafted in the United States Army on August 10, 1964, and assigned to Fort Polk, Louisiana for his basic training, later being assigned to Fort Benning for AIT to train as a radio repairman before his permanent assignment at Fort Hood, Texas. According to the official record, Coral's, per Coral's service was unblemished, but he apparently hated the military and applied for a discharge on hardship grounds that he was needed at his family's business. The Army granted his request, apparently not doing the research, and he was given an honorable discharge after 10 months of service. At this time, Coral announced to some of his close friends that he was actually homosexual and that he had encountered several homosexual experiences at this time. Excuse me. Following the discharge, Coral returned to the Houston Heights and resumed the position as vice president of the Coral Candy Company, or CCC, sorry. Coral's stepfather had retained ownership of the family business, Pecan Prince, and by 1963, the competition between the two firms was very bitter. In 1965, the CCC relocated to 22nd Street, where, which was directly across the street from Helms Elementary School. Coral was known to give the free can give free candy to all the local children, in particular the teenage boys. Oh, yeah, I have a bad feeling about that. As a result, he earned the nickname the Candy Man, or the Pied Piper. What? He wasn't whistling a frickin' flute to him. He was giving out candy. Maybe maybe they'll explain that. I don't know. The company also employed a workforce, and Coral was known to behave flirtatiously towards several of the teenage male employees. Oh, didn't that why he got fired? Bad I did, Dean. Coral's known to have installed a pool table at the end of the candy factory where the employees in other local use would hang out and shoot some pool. In 1967, Coral befriended 12-year-old David Owen Brooks, who was then a 6th grade student and one of the children that he gave free candy to. Brooks became one of Coral's closest friends, and Coral would often take Brooks along on his trips to South Texas beaches to check the competition of other candy companies. Whenever Brooks told Coral he needed money, Coral would often give him the cash, and the youth began to view Coral as a father figure. And at Coral's urging, starting in 1969, Coral would pay Brooks in cash or gifts to allow him to fillet Brooks. Oh, God. Wait. Is it Brooks twelve years old? He's twelve years old, and Coral's like in his in his at least in his twenties by now. So that's statutory rape. That's that's illegal. That's illegal. Why is Brooks needs to like call the police? Someone needs to call the police. Like if I see this twenty-something year old with this twelve-year-old, I'm gonna I'm gonna raise some flags. If I like if I don't know that their brother, if they, if they're if I if I don't know that they're not family, if, okay, if I don't know that. The relationship between them is not relative. I'm probably going to call the police. Sorry, I was going to stumble over my own words there. I apologize. Brooks' parents were divorced, and his father lived in Houston while his mother relocated to a city called Beaumont, which was 85 miles east of Houston. In 1970, at the age of 15, Brooks dropped out of Walter High School and moved in with his mother, though he would often return to Houston to visit his father, and at those times, he would stay with Coral at his apartment. Later the same year, Brooks moved back to Houston and began to view Coral's home as a second home. By the time that Brooks had dropped out of high school, Coral's mother had divorced her third from her third husband, and the CCC was closed in June 1968. Following the closure of the candy company, Coral took a job as an electrician at the HLNP, that's the Houston Lighting and Power Company, where he tested electric relay systems and remained in this position until the day of his death. The Murders Coral killed his first known victim, 18-year-old college freshman Jeffrey Conan, on September 25, 1970. Conan vanished while hitchhiking from the University of Texas to his parents' home. He was dropped off alone at the corner of Westheimer Road and South Voss Road near the uptown area of Houston, and it's likely that Coral offered Conan a ride, as, Con as at the time, Coral lived in an apartment on Yorktown Street near the intersection of Westheimer. Brooks led police to Conan's body on August 10, 1973. The body was buried at High Island Beach, and forensic scientists subsequently deduced that 
Conan had been killed with asphyxiation by manual strangulation and a cloth gag that had been placed in his mouth. His body was found beneath a large boulder, covered in a layer of lime, ooh, wrapped in plastic, naked and bound, suggesting he had been violated. Oh, God. Damn, I can't imagine how horrible that is. At the time of Conan's murder, Brooks interrupted Coral and explained that, and Coral promised Brooks a car in return for his silence about Conan's death. Brooks accepted the offer, and Coral later brought, bought him a green Chevrolet Corvette. Coral later told Brooks that he'd killed before and offered him $200, which was the equivalent of $1,437 as of 2022, for any boy that he could lure to the apartment. Oh, so he is like a Pied Piper. He's, he's getting people to lure children away. Although, rather, like in that story, I don't think the kids are going to come. Well, did the kids come back? I don't remember. I don't care. On December 13th, 1970, Brooks lured two 14-year-old Spring Branch youths named James Glass and Danny Yates from a religious rally. Why were they? Why were these 14-year-olds at a religious rally? To Coral's Yorktown apartment. Glass was an acquaintance of Brooks, who had previously visited Coral's address. Both youths were tied to opposite sides of Coral's torture board and subsequently raped, strangled, and buried in a boat shed he had rented on November 17th. An electrical cord with alligator clips attached to each was buried alongside Yates' body. Oh. Six weeks at wait, what's it what the hell's an alligator clip? I don't know. Six weeks after the double murder of Glass and Yates, on January thirtieth, seventy one, Brooks and Coral encountered teenage brothers Donald and Jerry Waldrop walking toward their parents' home. The Waldrips had previously been driven to a friend's house to discuss starting a bowling league, but had left when they discovered their friend wasn't home. Both boys were enticed in the court. Well, see, they couldn't do that now because everyone be asked, like has a cell phone, so they call them up and be all like, "Hey, you home? No, okay." I guess that they couldn't do that back then because this is the seventy. Yeah, seventy one. Yeah, seventy one. They didn't have cell phones, or maybe they did. I don't. I wasn't alive in seventy one. I'm pretty sure they were. Both boys were enticed into the van and driven to an apartment Coral had rented on Mangum Road. Mangum Road. Where they were raped, strangled, and subsequently buried in a bow shed. Between March and May 1971, Coral abducted and killed three victims, all of whom lived in the Houston Heights low income area, and all of whom were buried near toward the rear of the rented bow shed. How big is this bow shed? He's burying people in this thing. I'm sure this thing was smell bad at this point. In each of these abductions, Brooks was known to have been a participant. One of the victims, 15-year-old Randell Harvey, was last seen by his family cycling toward Oak Forest, where he worked part-time as a gas station attendant. Oak Forest? Is that, a, is that a town? It must be a town. I don't think anyone would put a gas station out in the middle of a forest. Maybe they would. I don't think they get very many people. What, what am I getting on? Hold on. Sorry. That's good coffee, by the way. I'm drinking Folgers again, everyone. Classic roast. You know, get on it. And Folgers, I'm open to sponsorship. So, I'll drink your coffee. I do drink your coffee. Harvey was driven to Carl's Mangum Road apartment, where he was killed by a single gunshot to the head. The other two victims, 13-year-old David Hilgeist, 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 and 16-year-old Gregory Malik Winkle, were abducted and killed together on May 29, 1971. As the youths began to disappear, the parents of the of the of the lost my case, lost my place. The parents of the kidnapped and abducted youths began to offer posters offering monetary reward for information leading to the boys' whereabouts. One of these boys, one of the youths who assisted in handing out these papers, was a 15-year-old Elmer Wayne Henley, a lifelong friend of Hilgist. The youth pinned the reward posters around the heights and attempted to reassure the parents that everything was all right. Yeah, if only. On August 17th, 1971, Coral and Brooks encountered 17-year-old Reuben Watson Haney. Reuben Watson Haney, walking home from a movie theater in Houston. Brooks persuaded Haney to attend a party at Coral's address in, on San Felipe Street, where he had previously moved, and Haney agreed, taken to the house, where he was subsequently strangled and buried in the bow shed. In September 1971, Coral moved to another apartment. How many apartments does this guy have? In the Heights, Brooks later, Brooks later stated he had, he had assisted Coral in the abduction and murder of two youths just before Wayne Henley came in the picture. 
Wait. Wayne Henley. Wasn't he that kid that was handing out the reward posters? Brooks stated the youth killed immediately. Brooks stated the youth killed immediately prior to Henley's involvement in the murders, was abducted from the heights and kept alive for four days before his murder. Oh, I couldn't imagine what pain he must have endured. Participation of Elmer Wayne Henley. In the winter of 1971, Brooks introduced Henley to Coral, likely as an intended victim. However, Coral evidently decided the youth would make a good accomplice and also offered him $200 for any boy he could lure to the apartment informing Henley that he was running a white slavery ring from Dallas. Oh, he's in Houston. How's he? Oh, it was operating from Dallas. He was just uh, in Houston. Okay. Well, still, that's bad. I would have gone to the police. Like, Henley, go to the police. Come on. Henley stated that for several months he ignored Coral's offer, although did maintain... Why would he... Why didn't he go to the cops? If he knows about that, why not... Does he know about Hilgist? Although he did maintain an acquaintance with Coral and gradually began to view him as a brother-type person with whom he could confide. Oh, that's that Pied Piper shit come back. The guy's obviously manipulative. And early in 1972, Henley decided to accept Coral's offer because him and his family were in dire financial problems. Excuse me. Sorry. Henley said the first abduction he participated in occurred when Coral resided at Schuler Street, 925 Schuler Street, an address he had moved into on how many God, how many how much real estate did this guy put his money into? Brooks later claimed that Henley became involved in the abductions while Carl resided at the address he had occupied immediately prior to Schuler Street. Oh, so they got different ideas on when. Wait, wait, well, it shouldn't matter. Henley shouldn't have joined them. He should have called the cops. If Henley's statement is to be believed, the victim was abducted from the Heights in February or March of 1972. In the statement Henley later gave to the police following his arrest, the youth stated he and Coral picked up a boy at the corner of 11th and Studwood and lured him back to Coral's home on the promise of smoking some weed with the pair. At Coral's residence, and in part of a ruse that they had set up, Henley handcuffed his hands, freed himself with a key hidden in his back pocket, and then tricked the youth into put donning the handcuffs before observing Coral bind and gag him. Henley then left the youth alone with Coral, believing he was going to be sold into that human trafficking ring. The identity of this first victim remains unknown. Oh, God, that's horrible. Like, could you imagine if, like, your child went missing and you never discover who it is, and then it turns out he was, like, abducted and murdered? Oh, my heart goes out to him. One month later, on March 24th, 1972, Henley, Brooks, and Coral encountered 18-year-old Frank Aguirre leaving a restaurant on a Yale Street where the youth worked. Henley called Aguirre over to Coral's van and invited the youth to drink beer and smoke some weed with the trio at Coral's apartment. Aguirre fought, agreed and followed the trio to the home in the Rambler in his Rambler. Inside Coral's house, Aguirre smoked some weed with the trio before picking up the handcuffs that Coral had left on the table. In quick response, Coral pounced on Aguirre, pushed him on the table, and handcuffed him behind his back. Henley later claimed that he had not known of Coral's true intentions toward Aguirre when he had persuaded the friend to accompany him to Coral's home. In a 2010 interview, he claimed to have per attempted to persuade Coral not to assault and kill Aguirre once they had bound and gagged the youth. However, Coral refused, informing Henley that he had raped, tortured, and killed the previous victim that Henley had, uh, Henley had assisted in abducting, and that he intended to do the same with Aguirre. Henley subsequently assisted Coral and Brooks in Aguirre's burial at the Highland Beach. Oh, God. You see? That's why you should have went to the cops. Dumbass. Despite the rep, well, I guess he, he couldn't after he abducted that one guy. That that first, well, he, he still could have. You know, he could have just, you know, swallowed his pride, gone to the police, went down with them. But he probably would have got less time because he didn't know what exactly the, you know, well, he knew what the reality was, but he didn't know what the re re reality was. Okay, sorry. One month later, on April twentieth, he assisted Henley assisted Coral and Brooks in the abduction of another youth, a seventeen-year-old named Mark Scott. Scott, who was well known to both Henley and Brooks, was grabbed by force and fought furiously against attempts by Coral to restrain him, even attempting to stab his attackers with a knife. There you go. Stab him. Stab him in the eye. However, Scott saw Henley pointing a pistol towards him, and according to Brooks, Scott just gave up. Now, see, like, I understand being in that situation and being scared, but, like, if it was me, if someone was coming towards me, which I, people aren't coming towards me because I'm, like, six foot five, but if it was me, I would like, you know, I'd be taking a knife and I could stab him, just stab him, like that. 
Like, even if you pull a gun on me, I'd be like, you better blow half my face, you, you better blow half my face off, because I'm taking an eye out, or a lip, or something. I'm taking something out. Like, whenever I get shot, just, like, I fall, and just, my knife just jabs him right in his junk. Scott was tied to the torture board that him, that Coral hung on his wall, and suffered the same fate as Aguirre, rape, torture, strangulation, and disposal of Island Beach. Brooks stated that Henley was very sadistic in his participation in the murders committed at Schuler Street. Before Coral vacated the address, Henley assisted Coral and Brooks in the abduction and murder of two youths named Billy Balch and Johnny DeLone. He stated that both youths were tied to Coral's bed, and after their torture and rape, Henley manually strangled Balch, then shouted, Hey, Johnny! and shouted and shot DeLone in the forehead with a bullet exiting the youth's ear. Oh, God. That's horrible. Both youths were buried at High Island Beach. During the time Coral resided at Schuler Street, the trio lured 19-year-old named William Ridinger to the house. Ridinger was tied to the plywood board, tortured and abused by Coral. Brooks later claimed he persuaded Coral to allow Ridinger to be released, and the youth was allowed to leave the residence. Did it go to the police? Did it, did it, go, did it go to the cops? On another occasion during the time, I guess not. I guess not. I would have I was, he, well, I'm not saying I would, because I've never been to that kind of trauma, but I can't put myself in, that, in those shoes. I could, I could never imagine. On another occasion, during the time Coral resided at Schuler, Henley knocked Brooks unconscious as they entered the house. Coral then tied Brooks to his bed and assaulted the youth repeatedly before releasing him. Oh, my God. He has, like, no freaking qualms. He just, like, attacked his own friend that he's been molesting with a friend. Attacking the guy he's been molesting forever. Despite the assault, Brooks continued to assist Coral in the abduction. What? Why would you do that? Like, even if I wouldn't go to the cops, if that happened to me and I knew that it was just that easy, I'd, you know, put on the hat, get the suitcase, and go. Get the fuck out of Texas. Well, he's a teenager, so I guess he can't really go that far. But his mom lives in Beaumont, so I mean, go to Beaumont and run away. After vacating the Shula Street residence, Coral moved to an apartment at Westcott Towers in the summer of 72. He's known to have killed a further two victims. 17-year-old Stephen Sickman was last seen leaving a party in the Heights before midnight on July 19th. The youth was savagely bludgeoned about the chest with an instrument before he was strangled and buried in the bow shed. Again with this bow shed. How big is this fucking bow shed? Is this like an aircraft carrier shed? What are they hiding in there? Well, besides the dead bodies. Oh, my God. Approximately a month later, on or about August 21st, 19-year-old Roy Button was abducted while walking to his house, to his job, sorry, as an assistant in the Houston shoe store. Button was gagged with a section of towel and his mouth bound with adhesive tape. He was shot twice in the head and, again, buried in the bow shed. It's fucking bow shed, man. Neither youth was named by either Brooks or Henley as being a victim of Coral, and both youths were only identified as victims in 2011. Oh, my God. This was in 19... So wait, it was nineteen seventy. Wait, it was nineteen seventy-two, and they didn't discover get discovered as victims until two thousand eleven. So that's like thirty-nine years being in the dark until their families were able to fit. Yeah, that's horrible. God Almighty. On October second, nineteen seventy-two, Henley and Brooks encountered two Heights teenagers named Wally J. Semino and Richard Hembry walking to Hembry's home. Semino and Hembry were enticed to the Corvette and driven to the Westcott Towers apartment. That evening, Simino is known to have phoned his mother's home and to have shouted the word mama into the receiver before the connection was terminated. Oh, God. That is horrible. I'm sorry. Like, anytime that happens, like, I know that, you know, like, I know that everybody has a mom and a dad. What? Everybody has a mother and stuff. And I'm sure, and all these victims that, I've, that we've talked in previous videos had parents but you know when you just when they say things like that and they yell for their mother before they get killed it's like oh my god it just tears my soul out the following morning Henry was accidentally shot in the mouth by him god dumbass with a bullet exiting through his neck several hours later both youths were strangled to death and subsequently buried in a common grave inside the bow shed directly above the bodies of James Glass and Danny oh my god how many bodies can this thing hold? How has nobody figured that out yet? Like, is, does it not smell bad? What are they doing in there? Well, I know what they're doing in there, but how are they not... How is... Okay. 
Sometime the following month, 18-year-old Oak Forest... Okay, Oak Forest must be a town. Hello, everyone in Oak Fo Forest who li might be listening to this. I thought your town was a forest, but I guess not. An 18-year-old Oak Forest youth named, known to both Coral and Henley named Will Willard Branch disappeared while hitchhiking from Mount Pleasant to Houston. His gag and emasculated body was buried in the bush. Oh, my God. On November 15th, a 19-year-old Heights youth named Richard Kepner disappeared. On his way to a phone booth, Kepner was strangled and buried at High Island Beach. At least 10 teenagers between the ages of 13 and 19 were murdered between February and November of 1972. Five were buried at High Island Beach and five inside the boat shed. This boat shed must really smell pretty ripe by now. On January 20th, 73, Coral moved to an address on Work Road in the Spring Branch District of Houston. In two weeks of moving, he had killed 17-year-old Joseph Lyles. On March 7th, Coral vacated his work road apartment and moved to 2020 Lamar Drive, which is an address his father had vacated in Pasadena. This, this guy just likes to move around. Does he ever get... I wonder how, much, how many things he's lost. In it. Well, I don't care, because apparently he didn't care either. The only thing he can manage is to take with him is this fucking torture board. Sick bastard. On June 4th, Henley and Coral abducted 15-year-old William Ray Lawrence. The youth was last seen by his father. After three days of abuse and torture, Lawrence was strangled before being buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Less than two weeks later, 20-year-old Raymond Stanley Blackburn was abducted, strangled, and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. You know, like, I don't, I hear about all these places, this Lake Sam Rayburn and this High Island Beach. I don't want to go to these places now. This this has really turned me off from wanting to vacation at any of these places. And I know what you think, you, know, you might be thinking, like, oh, Tyler, I'm sure you've been to Green River and you know the Green River Killer. Yes, I have been to Green River. And I have swam in the water, and I have choked on the water when diving in wrong. But you know what? I didn't know that there was a Green River killer who was disposing people there at the time. I didn't find that out until years late. Until years later, yeah, years later, and it was years after that he had been doing all that. So, no, I know about this now, and I'm not going to go to this Lake Sam Rayburn or the High Island Beach or the Boat Shed for sure. If it still stands. On July 6, 1973, Henley began attending classes at the Coaches Driving School in Bel Air, where he became acquainted with 15-year-old Homer Luis Garcia. The following day, Garcia phoned his mother to say he was spending a night with a friend and was shot and left to bleed to death in Coral's bathtub before he was buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Five days later, on June, July 12th, 17-year-old John Sellers of Orange County was bound and shot to death and buried at High Island Beach. In July of 1973, after Brooks married his pregnant fiance, Henley became the only sole procurer of victims, assisting in the abduction and murder of three Heights youths between July 19th and 25th. One of these victims was 15-year-old Michael Balch, who was the brother of previous victim Billy Balch. Oh, not the same family. He was last seen by his family on July 19th going to get a haircut. He was strangled and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. The other two, Charles Cobble and Marty Ray Jones, were abducted together on the afternoon of July 25th. Henley later buried both of his bodies in the bow shed. This bow shed. Dear God. On August 3rd, 1973, Coral killed his last victim, 13-year-old from South Houston, named James Stanton Dramala. Dramala was abducted by Brooks and Coral while riding his bike to Pasadena and driven to Lamar Drive upon the pretense of collecting empty glass bottles to resell. See, I didn't get a chance to do that. Like, I saw cartoons where they would do that. They would get glass bottles and, and like sell them for 10 cents or whatever. I never got to do that. I guess recycling just wasn't that important when I was a kid. Or now. I'd still do that if I could, but there's no places around here to do that. I don't think. At Coral's home, Jim Mala was tied to Coral's torture board where he was raped, tortured, and strangled Damn. with a cord before being buried in the bow shed. Brooks later described Jim Mala as a small blonde boy for whom he had bought a pizza and whose company he had spent 45 minutes before the youth was murdered. The death of Coral. I hope he dies. Sick bastard. Oh, seriously, I, this is getting me. This this might be the worst. On the evening of August 7th, 1973, Henley, age 17, invited 19-year-old named Timothy Cordell Curley to attend a party at Coral's Pasadena residence. Curley, who was a casual friend of Coral's, was an, intended to be the next victim, and he accepted the offer. Brooks was not present at this time. Two youths arrived at the two youths arrived at Coral's house where they sniffed paint. Sniff paint. <laughs> they, why would you sniff paint? Are you that stupid? You yeah, because sniff the paint. And they drank alcohol until midnight before leaving, promising to return. 
Henley and Curly then drove back to Houston Heights, and Curly parked his vehicle close to Henley's home. They exited, and upon hearing commotion across the street, met with 15-year-old friend Rhonda Louise Williams walking toward her home. Williams, nursing a sprained ankle, had been beaten by her drunken father, and accepted invitation to join her to join Henley and Curly at Coral's home. Williams climbed into the back seat of the Volkswagen, and they started towards the Pasadena residence. At 3 a.m. on the morning of August 8, 73, Henley and Curly, accompanied by Williams, returned to the residence. Coral was pissed that, or furious that Henley, well, he's probably pissed, I think he's pissed, that Henley had brought a girl to his house, telling him in private that he had ruined everything. Henley explained that Williams had argued with her father and didn't want to go home. Coral appeared to calm down and offered the trio beer and weed. They smoked, drank, while Henley and Curly also continued to sniff paint fumes. Yeah, that's just gross. Why would you sniff paint fumes? What, is weed not good enough or drinking not good? You want to sniff some? Yeah, I'm going to sniff some paint so my, so my snot can turn green. Yeah. Because that way I can sneeze and I can, like, blow green snot every Yeah, it's disgusting. And uh, Do you think you're high? Do you get high off, 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 off inhaling paint? What What was that, like, get paint? Like, I'm an artist. I like to paint. I've never once thought about just grabbing that paintbrush and just sticking up my nose. <laughs> no. I'm good. Two hours later, Henley, Curly, and Williams passed out. Henley awoke to find himself lying on his stomach and Coral snapping handcuffs on him. Curly and Williams lay beside Henley, securely bound with nylon rope, gagged with adhesive tape, and lying face down. Curly had been stripped naked. Uh-oh. <laughs> Noting Henley had awoken, Coral removed the gag from his mouth. Henley protested in vain about the actions, whereupon Coral reiterated that he was angry that Henley had brought a girl to the house, and he was going to kill all three of them after he finished assaulting and torturing Curly. Initially stating, man, you blew up. Well, he's from, I guess he's from Texas, so I mean, man, you blew it bringing that girl. I'm going to kill you all, but first I'm going to have my fun. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, people from Texas. I know you don't all talk like that. But most of you do. He then repeatedly kicked Williams in the chest before lifting Henley to his feet and dragging them into the kitchen to place a twenty-two caliber pistol against his stomach, threatening to shoot him. Henley called Coral, promising to participate in the torture and murder of Williams and Curly if Coral would let him go. After thirty minutes of talking, Coral agreed and untied Henley, who then Curl who then these names, who then carried Curly and Williams into the bedroom and tied them on opposite sides of the torture board. Coral then handed Henley a hunting knife and told him to cut off Williams' clothes insisting that while he would rape and kill Curly, Henley would likewise do the same to Williams. Henley began to cut away at her clothes, at, at Williams' clothes, as Coral began to assault and torture Curly. Both Curly and Williams awoke at this point. Curly began writhing and shouting as Williams looked over to Henley and asked, Is this for real? To which Henley answered, Yes. Williams then asked Henley, Are you going to do anything about it? Well, no. Ain't done anything so far. Why would he lift a freaking finger? Henley then asked Coral whether he could take Williams in the other room. While Coral ignored him, Henley then grabbed Coral's pistol, shouting, You've gone far enough, Dean. As Coral clambered off Curly, Henley elaborated, I can't go on any longer. I can't have you kill all my friends. Like, why do you keep bringing your friends to him, you dumbass? Coral approached Henley, saying, Kill me, Wayne. Henley stepped back a few places, spaces as Coral continued to advance towards him, shouting, You won't do it. Henley then fired at Coral. He shot him, hitting him in the hitting him in the forehead. The bullet failed to penetrate Coral's skull, and he continued to go to walk towards Henley. Whereupon the youth fired two more rounds, hitting Coral in the left shoulder. There you go. Yeah. Coral then ran out of the room, hitting the wall of the hallway. Shoot him again. Shoot him again. Henley fired three additional bullets into the lower back and shoulder as Coral slid down the wall in the hallway outside the room where the other two teenagers were bound. Coral died where he fell. Naked body lying face toward the wall. You know what? If it had been me, I wouldn't have stopped there. I would have walked up to him, and I would have just taken I would have taken my gun, and I would have just emptied the clip into his like, bam, 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 bam. And then after that, I'd reload the gun, and then I'd do it again. Bam, 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 bam. And then I'd call the cops. Henley would later recall that having shot Coral, the only thought in his mind at the moments immediately thereafter was that Coral would have been proud of Oh, my God. Would have been proud of the way he'd behaved during the confrontation that he had been training him to react quickly and forcefully, and that this is exactly what he had done. You know what? No, it's that manipulation again. He's like his big brother. And, no, who cares what Coral would think? He's dead. And he was a violent rapist, mass murderer. Fuck him. Aftermath. Elmer Wayne Henley and David Allen Brooks were tried separately for their roles in the murders. 
Henley was brought to trial in San Antonio on July 1st, 1974, charged with six murders committed between March 72 and July of 73. The prosecution called dozens of witnesses, including Curley and Reitinger. Hey, Reitinger. I guess he did end up going to the police. Reitinger testified that at Coral's home, he was tied to the torture board and assaulted repeatedly by Coral before he was released. Other incriminating testimony came from the police officers who read Henley's written statements. In several of the statements, one such was that while... Sorry. While he had brought Cobble and Jones to Coral's Pasadena residence, the youths were tied one wrist and ankle bound to the same side of the torture board, and the youths were then forced by Coral to fight each other with the promise that the youth who beat the other to death would be allowed to live. That's disgust. That's just fucking horrible. I'm so glad you're dead, Coral. Sick bastard. Cobble, I'm sorry. After an hour of watching the youths, after several hours of watching the youths beating each other, Jones was tied to the board and forced to watch Cobble again be assaulted, tortured, and shot to death before he himself was raped, strangled with a Venetian blind cord. A Venetian blind cord. That's that. That's that curtain. That Venetian blinds. You know, you pull the chain and it goes. <laughs> Dear God. Several victims' parents had to leave the courtroom to regain their composure. As police and medical examiners described how the relatives were tortured and murdered, I understand that. I don't, I'm not even related to any of these, any of these kids, and I don't even want to talk about it. This is just horrible. Upon advice from the defense counsel, Henley did not take the stand to testify. His attorney, William Gray, cross-examined several witnesses, but didn't call any witnesses or experts for the defense. Well, yeah, because there was no defense. The dude went in on it. He was part of it. On July 15th of 74, both counsels presented their closing arguments to the jury, the prosecution seeking life imprisonment. The defense, a verdict of not guilty. Well, of course he was guilty. He signed confessions, and he was part of it. How is no way getting he's part of it? He knew what was going on. In his closing argument to the jury, District Attorney Carol Vance apologized for his not being... Carol Vance apologized for his not being... Is Carol a unisex name? Well, that's from Texas. Other from Texas. Everybody has... Some people have female names from what I hear. I guess Carol is a man's name. I didn't know that. Well, apologize for not being able to seek the death penalty, adding that the case was the most extreme example of man's inhumanity that I have man I have ever seen. I don't know. I've read some seriously fucked up shit, but that's definitely one of them. This is definitely one of them. The jury deliberated for 92 minutes before finding Henley guilty of all six murders that he was tried for. Judge Preston Dial, on August 8th, ordered that Henley serve each 99-year sentence consecutively, totaling 594 years. Yeah, that ought, keep, that ought to keep him in there. Just keep his bones in there, too, until they turn to dust. Keep the dust in there, too. He was transferred to the Huntsville unit to formally begin his sentence. Brooks' trial lasted less than a week. The jury deliberated for 90 minutes before they reached a verdict. He was found guilty of Lawrence's murder on March 4th, 75, and also sentenced to life imprisonment. Brooks showed no emotion as the sentence was passed, although his wife burst into, his wife stayed with him, what? Because she found out he was, like, part of this? I don't know if I would have done the same. Brooks also appealed his sentence, like, you know, I, Brooks has been, in, Brooks has been manipulated from, like, day one, when he was, like, 12 years old, so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sympathizing with him, I'm not taking his side, but he's, he's as much a victim as any of them. Henley, on the other hand, Henley's not a victim. Henley should have gone to the police, several times, and did not. His final appeal was dismissed in May 1979. Henley is serving his life sentence at the Mark W. Michael unit in Anderson County. Oh, I'm sorry. He, uh, Brooks uh, tried to appeal the sentence, contending that the signed confessions against him were taken without being informed of legal rights. Okay. But this appeal was dismissed in May 1979. Henley serving his life sentence at the Mark W. Michael unit in Anderson County, Texas. Successive parole applications dating from July 1980 have been denied. He is next eligible for parole in October 2025. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get it. Brooks served his life sentence at the Terrell Unit near Rocher in Texas. He died of COVID-19 related uh, complications at a Galveston hospital on May 28, 2020 at the age of 65. That was really dark. That was that was some fuck that was some dark shit. I honestly gotta say I don't think I've any of the cases we've read so far the quiche or the the Nakata guy were as dark as that. 
I think the next crime is going to be something a little lighter. Maybe not as bad. I feel like I need like a shower now. I can get a bad taste in my mouth. I guess that's what we got coffee for, right? Well, everyone, thanks for joining me on this one. If you would, please like and subscribe. Share the video. And uh, I'll see you next time.